God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and out with pitch. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you. When you hear of Noah's Ark, what comes to mind? A bedtime story, a fairy tale, a myth, a, a legend? Is it just an insignificant incident from the distant mists of time that is totally irrelevant for the Bible after the first 11 chapters of Genesis? Does it even matter whether there was a great flood or not? One of the most important perspectives on the Old Testament person, Noah, actually comes from the New Testament. Now, if it's not enough that the apostles mentioned Noah, Christ himself in Matthew chapter 24 actually mentions Noah again as an opportunity to teach further about his own second coming. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. If Noah and the flood were significant enough for Jesus to use them to illustrate his return on Judgment Day, then it's certainly deserving of an extended study. So let's take a look at some of the issues that are involved. Could Noah have possibly been 600 years old when the, the flood came? Did ancient people like Noah have technology to build a huge ocean-going ship? Could all those animals really fit in the ark? Where did all the water come from? And where did it all go afterwards? Why is it that almost every ancient culture has a story of creation and a story of the flood? Ken Ham is the president and CEO of Answers in Genesis US and the highly acclaimed Creation Museum. He has appeared on numerous network and cable news programs and is in much demand as a speaker on the topic of creation. The Bible's not the only source where we hear about this destructive flood. It's throughout the world, isn't it? When I went to university, I remember one of my professors saying, the Babylonians have stories about a flood uh, just as you're reading the Bible. So it's obvious the Jews borrowed their stories from the Babylonians. Well, I would say it was the other way around. Actually, when you read the Babylonian accounts, for instance, uh, one of the accounts has a boat that's a cube about six stories high. Now, if you think about it, that wouldn't be a very stable boat. When you look at the Bible's account, uh, the ship there that Noah was instructed to build has a six to one ratio. In other words, it was built as a real ship to survive a real flood. But it's not just the Babylonians. The Australian Aborigines, for instance, they have a number of accounts of a flood that a man built a raft, he had three sons, it landed on a mountain, God put a rainbow in the sky at the end. Very similar elements to the Bible, but so do other cultures all over the world. Now, how could this be? Well, I suggest it's not that the Jews borrowed this story from the Babylonians or whatever, but that God's record in His Word has been handed down. And since the time of the Tower of Babel, when God gave different languages because of man's rebellion, people took those accounts with them, they changed them. There's elements that are still similar, but it attests to the fact that there was a real flood in history. That might explain why we find traces of the Bible's flood account embedded in the very language of China. What I'm about to show you is just absolutely fascinating. I don't know how many of you know ancient Chinese, but the written Chinese language is based upon characters or uh, pictures that tell a story. Consider this. The word for devil is the compound of three word characters, garden, mankind, and lie. Remind you of Genesis 3? The word for forbidden is the compound of two word characters, tree 
in God's command. And finally, and, and when the first time I saw this, I was really amazed. The word for flood is the compound of these three word characters. Eight, within, boat. Is this simply a cultural accident? Or is the presence of creation and flood stories, the long forgotten echoes of Noah and his sons sitting around and recounting the details of the flood to their children, grandchildren, and, and great-grandchildren? So who was this Noah? We first meet him at his birth in Genesis 5, 29. Lamech, his father, gives him the name Noah, which means rest, comfort, or relief. For Lamech said, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Chapter 5 in Genesis lists the genealogy from Adam down to Noah. The next chapter sets the framework for the flood and answers the puzzling question why God would create a beautiful, magnificent earth filled with a wide variety of animals and humans, and then turn around, regret creating it, and decide to destroy it with a flood. When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. So here, the sons of God are probably godly sons that are godly and are serving God and trusting Him. And then the daughters of men would reflect those that turned away from God. And so that when the sons of God intermarried with the daughters of men, we have a godly line of people intermarrying with an ungodly line of people, resulting in all people being ungodly in the end because the wicked corrupt the good in subsequent generations. As more and more humans rejected their Creator, He set down an ultimatum. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. Well, the 120 years is, is not spelled out in the kind of detail that we'd like to have. So you have these two options. Lifespan will be no more than 120 years. The problem with that interpretation is that we have a lot of people subsequent to Genesis 6 that lived to be a lot longer or a lot older than 120 years of age. So that makes the other interpretation much more likely that there's going to be 120 years between the time that God says, I'm not going to strive with mankind anymore. I'm going to give them a limited amount of time to turn back to me, to repent, and also to give Noah time to build this massive ark that would have been a huge architectural accomplishment in that day. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Uh, the word Nephilim comes from the Hebrew word to fall, so it would mean fallen ones or falling ones. So the Nephilim are probably mighty warriors, strong, sturdy men. And so these were people that were looked up to by the people of their day. God is painting a vivid picture of the humans he was preparing to wipe off the face of the earth with the flood. But he wasn't finished yet. The judgment continues. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. It's very possible that the long lifespans of people in those early chapters of Genesis is one of the reasons why wickedness became more prominent and rampant all over the earth because people were living longer. Not only can, can good people live longer, but wicked people can live longer and continue in their wickedness and discover new ways to sin. Mankind is getting worse and worse. Then verse 8 changes it all up. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. In verse 9, we see for the first time how much Noah stood out from the other humans. Listen to how he was described. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. 
And what does it mean to be righteous and blameless? What does walk with God mean? To walk with God is to live a godly life, to be concerned about right and wrong, and to seek to do that which is right. Because it's not a phrase that's used of any of other Noah's contemporaries, that means he distinguished himself as being a godly man who not only lived a godly life, but had the faith in the promise of a Savior that made that righteous living possible. In the next session, we'll look at the construction issues for the ark. But first, there's a big credibility issue. In chapter 7 of Genesis, we read, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month on the 17th day of the month, on that day the fountains of the great deep burst forth. According to the Bible, Noah was 600 years old when the flood came and lived another 350 years after that. In fact, if the sixth chapter of Genesis is to be believed, most people before the flood lived extremely long lives. No wonder people find these first chapters of the Bible hard to believe. But if it's true, how did people live that long? Before joining the staff at Answers in Genesis, Dr. David Menton served as Associate Professor of Anatomy at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri. The average age of the genealogy of Adam is over 850 years old. Was it really possible for people to live that long before the flood? What would account for that? Well, you know, uh, you look at somebody like Methuselah, lived to be 969 years old, and what a pity he died then, such a young man. Now, how can I say such a young man? <laughs> you know, in a way, our body doesn't get older. It's been estimated that probably no part of your body ever gets over about 15 years old. For example, our skin, completely the surface layer, the epidermis, turns over every month. So if we don't see one another for a month, a whole new skin. Uh, our uh, GI tract lining is turning over in four, four days. Uh, blood cells, red blood cells, 100 days or so, white blood cells a week or so. Really, it's just the brain and the heart muscle that probably doesn't turn over very much. But even they are turning over molecule by molecule. So uh, something went wrong after the fall, <laughs> where even though our body is constantly replacing and making itself new, it just isn't doing it right. So, for example, an old person like me has skin that isn't stretchy anymore, and yet it's no older skin than uh, younger people have. Uh, so I don't find it too surprising people live to be that age. I guess the real surprise is what on earth happened that they don't live very long anymore. In our next session, we'll look at the ark and examine how a 500-year-old man could build such a huge ocean-going vessel without power tools.